Okay, excellent. Good afternoon and welcome to uh, this MIT Energy Initiative lecture series. My name is Christoph Weinert. I'm an associate professor in building technology in the architecture department here. And it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Gail Barger. I was asked to be very short. There are, of course, some things uh, that you probably read before coming here that you should know about Gail. She's a powerhouse in research from California that has worked on energy efficiency and occupant comfort for 30 years by now and has done lots of work, lots of paper in the field. And I thought I'd share something that you don't find online, which is really a specialty of Gail, that she uh, not only does high quality research, but she convinces people in standards committee that this research should actually be converted into code. And this affects all of us. For those of you that are familiar with ASHRAE 55, let's see, who knows what uh, ASHRAE 55, what that is? Great, so it's basically what it does. It allows us to design for naturally ventilated buildings in spaces and let the buildings get a little warmer than we would have said before and we have made it legal, or Gail has convinced the powers that are that this is legal to do so. And that, of course, opened up an incredible opportunity for this whole field to try more exciting things uh, without being sued. And that's, of course, especially in the United States, a key uh, barrier if you, if you can't do that to uh, get any information into buildings. So this is what I wanted to share, Gail. We are really excited to have you here today and show you what's on the horizon, what's going to be legal in the next coming years. <laughs> Please, everybody, help me welcome uh, Gail Barger. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to be here and see some um, old friends and colleagues in the audience. Um, so let's get started. I think we all know about the connection between climate change and energy. And my job here is not to try to convince you of how important this is. I think that you all know that. But the point I want to make is that I think that a lot of the things that we can do to both mitigate the effects of, um, mitigate climate change, but also mitigate the, the impacts on the environment through designing for greater resiliency and our ability to adapt to what's inevitably going to happen, a lot of those things are going to improve our quality of life. So we might as well be doing them anyway. And even to the climate deniers, do we really want to take that chance and experiment to ourselves? My argument today, however, is that energy and, and designing for energy and designing for comfort are inseparable. That we cannot design low energy buildings that create environments that are uncomfortable for the occupants, or conversely, design high quality indoor environments that require a lot of energy to maintain them, or those strategies are not going to be reprodu reproducible and have the transformative change that we need in our society. And unfortunately, right now, we're both spending a lot of energy to make a lot of people uncomfortable. So I understand that this. Uh, lecture series focuses on energy but not necessarily buildings and that we have a mixed audience and so I wanted to orient people to why I think buildings are important and one of them is that connection to climate change and carbon emissions. Buildings are responsible for nearly half of the carbon emissions in this country and the trend is increasing. So even though we're starting to flatten out in transportation and energy, the trend of energy use in buildings continues to go up, and this is not sustainable. So where is all that energy going? This pie chart looks at the um, energy use in buildings compared to industry and transportation, but then takes the buildings piece of it and divides it up. It's about 50-50 residential commercial, a little bit higher in residential buildings, but about 40% of that energy is being used to heat and cool and ventilate buildings for the occupants. So people matter, and we need to make that connection, and that's what my talk is about today. So a lot of people argue that, well, it costs too much to try to reduce energy and greenhouse gases in buildings, and I think there's a lot of evidence to the contrary. This McKinsey curve, I'm uh, imagining that a lot of people in the audience are familiar with this. Um, a, a couple of caveats about this curve. It's a little bit outdated. 
and there's some controversy about the methods used to actually calculate it. So my point here today is not to talk about the numbers per se, but I think the message is still really important. And what you're seeing here is the technologies that, that are, were estimated to be required to reduce a third of our carbon emissions by 2030. They are lined up in terms of the cost from the least to the most expensive. The width of the bar is the amount of carbon reduction. The y-axis is the cost. So what you can see is that when there are uh, technologies that are below the, the horizontal axis here, that means that they don't just cost less, they actually save money. And when we zero in on those technologies, a lot of these are in the domain of the architect. Things that we can do to reduce energy and carbon emissions at the same time that we save money. So it seems pretty silly not to do these things. So how many people have heard of the Architecture 2030 Challenge? OK, some but not all. So how are we going to move forward? How are we going to motivate people? Ed Masria is the leader of this Architecture 2030 Challenge. And it's basically putting out this mandate that all new buildings, developments, and major renovations should be carbon neutral by 2030, but have put forward this tiered approach to reduce the uh, fossil fuel energy by 70% in all new buildings today, and then ratchet it down so that by 2030, buildings are carbon neutral. Now, one of the things that's important about the 2030 challenge is it's just a challenge, but there have been numerous districts, cities, and states that have been adopting this into their codes. And my understanding is that Cambridge has its own set of incentives or mandates to reduce carbon emissions in buildings. So how are we going to do this? Uh, the ARC 2030 Challenge, they've got a great website. So for those of you who want to learn more, I encourage you to check it out. That they divided up into the design strategies this is where most of the reductions can take place, about what can we do through design. And I would, I would actually expand that to say through design and operation of buildings. Okay. Once you are able to reduce your energy use through design and operation, then you want to think about where are you getting that energy from. And that's um, looking at on-site renewables first. And then finally, where are you buying your energy off-site? So a lot of us who teach in the building technology area are focusing on this here, and that's where we believe the largest energy reductions can be made. This is a term that's being used quite a lot in our industry now, and it's getting increasing attention, zero net energy buildings. The idea here is that over the course of a year, so not in any given moment, but over a course of the year, the building is going to generate as much as it's using. If it generates more than it's using and it sells back on a net basis to the utilities, then it may be a net positive building. And that's actually where we're trying to push forward as well. But what's the power of the zero? This is really important. I think net zero energy buildings has gone from what, what people thought were just this, this abstract impossibility to something that is a very probable part of our future. And I think the power of zero is grabbing people's attention. I think it's very easy to use abstract concepts about well, what percent below code, and how are you measuring that, and what code, and let's do better, and let's use less. But zero is a very definable um, construct that can be measured, can be verified, and it's a really, really clear target. What's not so clear, however, is the explosion in vocabulary that has been taking place. All these kinds of terms are being used right now. Right? They all basically share a similar goal, though, of course, of reducing the energy use and the associated environmental impacts. The trend I've been seeing and the terms that I'm going to be using in some slides I'm showing next are down here. So ultra-low energy. That's being defined as a building that is pretty comparable to the zero net energy in terms of getting its energy use intensity down, 
but for whatever reason it has not been able to invest in the renewables that allow it to get to the net zero. But its energy performance is similarly reduced. And then the terms I'm also going to be using in the subsequent slides, zero net energy verified and emerging. Verified means there's actually monitored data over at least one year to verify that yes, over the course of a year, this building generated as much as it used. An emerging zero net energy building means that they've set it at that target. They've got renewable energy on site. They're working towards that. But maybe it hasn't been a year yet. Maybe they've just fallen short. Maybe they're having challenges in monitoring it. So you don't actually get that final number. Now, the other thing I want to point out is the very definition of zero net energy buildings is actually quite diverse. And again, they all share this common goal of trying to reduce energy use in buildings. Um, so very briefly, the, the most common two definitions are in terms of site and source energy. So site energy means what you're measuring in your building. Of all these four measures, it's the simplest to calculate. And therefore, it's maybe one of the more commonly used. Also, if you happen to be generating net energy, sur uh, I'm sorry, surplus energy and selling it back to the grid, it actually makes it one of the easier metrics to calculate. However, source energy gets closer to what we're trying to achieve. The problem with site energy is it doesn't account for the efficiencies of conversion of fuel at the power point. It doesn't account for transmission and generation losses. All of those are accounted for in source energy. So it's a much more rigorous metric, but it's much more uh, difficult to calculate. Similarly, net zero energy cost might be very effective in terms of a more marketable uh, definition very difficult to, ca to, to calculate because utility rates vary so much and other factors as well. And then finally, net, net zero emissions. This is really what we're trying to get at. So in some ways, this is probably the most uh, rigorous of all the measures, but again, difficult to calculate. So one point I want to make is that regardless of the definitions, the common goal is to first reduce as much energy as you can in the building before you then start supplying the renewables. So regardless of building type, one of the ways to um, interpret this triangle of priorities is that at the top, this is really about reducing the need. right? Reducing your loads, using passive systems, reducing how much energy you're going to need in the first place. After you've done that, using efficient mechanical systems, and what happens is if you reduce the load so that it's smaller, you actually open yourself up to more options about the different kinds of systems that are out there that may be much more efficient that can handle smaller loads. And finally, finally, at the very end is when you want to look at renewable energy generation. If you have a building that's been poorly designed and you slap on photovoltaics and try to say, oh, look, I have a green building, the analogy I use there is the leaky bucket. If the bucket is the envelope of your building, the water is the energy you're putting into your building, it just doesn't make sense to keep finding alternative sources of water or energy and keep pouring it into the bucket before you've sealed up the holes first. So that's an analogy to trying to make a good building first and the renewables that you slap on the roof come at the, last, at the last stage. And this has impacts not just thinking about the building scale, which is what this set of priorities is about, but anybody here who works more at the district scale is interested in looking at issues of integration with the grid, is familiar with the duct curve, knows that what happens if you have an a energy wasteful building and just slap on a lot of photovoltaics you can have some uh, pretty big grid impacts as well. All right, so what I want to do before I start talking about some of the, own, uh, the research of my group is to give you a sense of what's happening with zero net energy buildings. And the best source by far is the New Buildings Institute up in Portland. 
They have a tremendous website. They have a lot of resources that are free. If this is a field that any of you are interested in, I encourage you to um, check it out. And so these are going to be the sources of the next set of graphs that I'm going to be showing you. So I want to give a shout out to them. Um, we collaborate with them often on many research projects, and I have great respect for the people working there. So first, how much energy are these buildings needing before you even start thinking about what kind of energy are you using to supply that? So there's a metric called energy use intensity, which is the energy per square foot per year that a building uses. The CBEX is a database that looks at average consumption across the US. Um, this is an average of new building codes. And then you could see here that the ZNE buildings in this database were under 20, which is quite low. And once you get the EUI down to under 20, it's relatively straightforward to be able to supply that with photovoltaics. Now, in this database, the ultra low buildings are a little bit higher, but still significantly lower than these averages. So how many Z&E and, and ultra-low buildings are in this database? Not a lot. It's still a goal. This is a relatively small number compared to our building stock. But I think the really important thing to note here is the trend. So where we thought that this was a lofty goal that was going to be very difficult to achieve, the total number of Z&E buildings has more than doubled during each of these two-year periods that this organization has been keeping a database. And I think these trends are best seen in this timeline, where the orange is the ultra-low, the, the Z&E emerging, and the Z&E verified, or in the blue and the green. So here you could see where there has been um, exponential growth, particularly in the emerging buildings. So as we've proven technologies and as we've demonstrated that the cost for doing this is, can really be comparable to an average building, the number of buildings that are setting this as a goal for themselves, even if they haven't yet monitored for a full year, even just in this last year, has been exponentially increasing. And that's really exciting. So people say, ah, oh, well, you can do that in California. You're from California, right? Look at this. And so, OK, California is in the lead. But we are now, <laughs> we are now seeing buildings in nearly every climate zone across North America. So these are, the, um, the dark is the number of buildings that are Z&E emerging or verified. I'd like to give a shout out to Massachusetts. You're in the top five. So you should feel good about that. Um, everybody's got a lot of catching up to do in California. Okay? That's really a combination, not just that we have a temperate climate and we have brilliant design professionals, but we have extremely ambitious um, policies that are making this um, easier for people to follow because they don't have to think, should we, shouldn't we? You have to. And the more precedents there are, it's easier for the next ones and easier for the next ones. Size. Here's the other thing people say. Well, you can do this in small buildings. And historically, it really was the small one-story buildings that were achieving z and &E. They're small. They've got a lot of roof area. Makes sense. But one of the things, and, and the z and &E verified buildings, you're certainly seeing that these are the smaller. So if you're in the back and you can't see, these, uh, this legend goes from 0 to 5,000 square feet, 5 to 10, 10 to 25, and up. Okay. So the z &E verified buildings, the ones who have been around long enough to have a whole year's worth of data, yes, they're still mostly small buildings. But this is really exciting. The z &E emerging buildings, really diverse sizes. And the best way to show this is I want to look at these larger buildings, because that's what we're looking for. This is now a, a, a trend of just those larger buildings. And look at that incredible growth. And I think this is a really important and exciting trend in z and &E. OK, who owns these buildings? Two thirds of the buildings are public buildings. That actually used to be a higher number. So the private are um, increasing. But the public buildings are still really the, the um, trendsetters here. 
And some of that, I think, is because uh, a lot of the uh, municipalities are looking at ZNE because of their relationship to resiliency. They are the first to start thinking long term, what are we going to do to make our cities more resilient, more adaptable to the inevitable impacts of climate change that are already occurring. I think that a lot of the codes and standards are first targeted at public buildings. And then there's also a connection to education, I think, in the public buildings, where they want to use ZNE to try to educate the public about what's possible. And that's also seen where we start looking at what kind of buildings are going after ZNE. The good news is we're seeing a range of building types. The reports I showed have lists of all of the buildings, and we're starting to see more high intensive um, buildings like hospitals and restaurants becoming ZNE. But education is still. Um, got the strongest component, and particularly in the K through 12 schools, which makes a great connection to our kids. And if they can grow up learning about these technologies, that's, that's fantastic in itself. OK, this is also um, an exciting uh, graph in my mind. It's not really exciting graphically. It's actually pretty simple. <laughs> but the message is really important. And too often, I know in schools in particular, in architecture schools, we're always talking about new buildings and doing the exciting one-off buildings. But in this country in particular, if we don't start having an effect on the existing building stock, we are in big trouble. So there used to be a thought of, oh, you can only do this if you start from the ground up and you have everybody around the table from day one. But look at this, a quarter of the buildings in this database are renovations. So hopefully that slice of the pie will increase. And um, again, the more precedence we have showing that this is possible to take an existing building and turn it into ZNE, I think, is really important. And my last two slides about trends don't actually come from New Building Institute. They come from a, an ASHRAE study that was looking particularly at what HVAC technologies are being used in, in, Z, in ZNE buildings. Sorry, I. I even get my tongue tied with vocabulary changes over the years. So what's really interesting is this ring here, which shows the number of HVAC technologies. So there's no one trick pony here. A lot of uh, people are still using air systems, but most of these buildings are using more than one technology. And part of that comes from a decoupling of the thermal and ventilation. Part of it comes from realizing that maybe there's different parts of the building that could be served by different technologies that you don't need just one solution that's going to fit the entire building. And so um, that's, that's a really interesting trend. Uh, what are those systems? Here's just an example of some of the systems that are being used. We're seeing an increase in radiant heating and cooling, and I'm going to be talking about that later. But another trend that this report showed is the same as that triangle that I showed you, that these buildings are all looking at passive strategies first. They're addressing that as the first priority and then looking at the mechanical systems. And, and I'm seeing more mechanical engineers from innovative firms that come to the design table and say, how can we get rid of mechanical systems? And back in the day, when a mechanical engineer's professional fees were tied to the cost of the mechanical system, that's a pretty risky thing to do. How can I get rid of the very system that my fees are based on? Well, fortunately, the, um, the fee structure has changed, and it has enabled some of the pioneering engineers to get in there and say, I want to be paid for helping you get rid of my services. OK, so this, uh, this talk is called the Energy Comfort Nexus. And as I argued before, these things have to go hand in hand. We cannot address one without the other. People matter. But unfortunately, we're currently using a lot of energy to not make comfortable buildings. So we're losing in both domains. We want to, with this to be a win-win, not a lose-lose. So this is one example of a study that was done by some researchers at LBNL. They monitored 100 buildings in the US. And what you see here is the solid line which is the recommended summer and winter comfort zone from ASHRAE, that we're supposed to be operating buildings warmer in the summer because we generally wear lighter clothing. Makes sense. But what are we actually doing here? 
The dotted line is the observed temperatures, and we're actually operating buildings at or below the way we're operating them in winter. That's the opposite of what's supposed to be happening. And it makes people what I would call maladaptive to the environments and starting to wear you know, warmer clothes in the summer. Or if they are wearing lighter typical summer clothes and they start complaining that it's too cold, well, this is the reason for that. So the reality, if we put those uh, temperature ranges on the psychrometric chart, we are operating buildings typically over a very narrow range that's constant year round and is more in line with the winter comfort zone, not accounting for the fact that people might change their clothing. So one of the things that is the basis for a lot of research we're doing in the Center for the Built Environment at, C at uh, CBE at UC Berkeley is to try to look at technologies for how can we simultaneously reduce energy and improve comfort. That's the bottom line. And this is, this is looking at simulations of rather than taking this narrow 2 degree C set point range, if we can expand that, relax that a little bit in ways that can still provide people with comfort, the potential energy savings are enormous. I think this is one of the biggest things we can do to save energy in buildings. And it's, it's something you change in the operation of buildings. So it's got the potential to impact existing buildings. So the question then is not, can we save money by expanding the set point range? That's pretty obvious. That's common sense. This is just quantifying it. But down here, what are the different technologies can we use to do that? Um, using natural ventilation in mixed mode buildings, I'll talk about that a little bit. Decoupling the thermal and ventilation strategies using radiant cooling, I'll talk about that a little bit. Using um, air movement, which is a really underutilized way to improve comfort, give us individual control, and use very little energy. I'm not talking about that because I just had to make some choices and cut some things out. So people matter. I've connected the, the people and the energy, but people matter just because of the money. So you're going to be sometimes talking to building owners that are not value driven. Maybe they don't care that the polar ice caps are melting, right? Send them my way. I'll have a talk with them. But, <laughs> but they are going to care about the money. And the cost of people and buildings is estimated to be two orders of magnitude higher than the energy operating costs. So if you only talk energy, people aren't going to listen. But if you can connect it to the people, that's where you can make a really big difference. Now, what are these, the, what are these big costs? These costs can either be direct costs associated with health care costs. They can be costs of the salaries of people. If you're having a building that's not comfortable to work in, you have sick building syndrome, people are absent. You have high rates of absenteeism as a result of the building. But what people are talking about more and more is the concept of presenteeism. That means I'm there, but I'm not focused. I'm, I'm uncomfortable. There's air quality problems. There's glare problems. I'm distracted. I'm really not working at my best. Okay. So if you can figure out a way to save energy, great. But if you can just improve productivity, for example, by a couple of percent, that's where the big money impacts are. And that's one of the big holy grails of building science research is how can we actually impact people. OK, so I've been talking about thermal comfort, but that is actually um, one of these broader uh, sets of attributes of the indoor environmental quality, the thermal lighting, indoor air quality, and acoustics. Right? So how are we doing? We're not doing very well in buildings right? on any of these fronts. So this is one of my favorite Dilbert cartoons showing that we're trying to satisfy all of the people all of the time. It's just not going to work. If you can't see it from the back, some people are saying, I can't hear myself think. It's too quiet in here. Turn down the heat. Turn up the heat. Um, it's really hard to type with your mittens on. You can fly a kite in this breeze. I don't think this air has moved since 1957. We all perceive the environment differently. This represents the facility manager's nightmare. But for us, what I see when I see this picture is a network of finely tuned sensors called people. 
And the challenge is how do you capture that information in a systematic way? So one of the things we do at CBE is in addition to doing a lot of um, simulation and lab studies, we also do a lot of field studies. In addition to physical measurements, we also do web-based surveys. And these surveys, we have one of the largest databases I know of, of um, an indoor uh, environmental quality surveys. We ask about these different attributes. Um, we do it for diagnostic purposes. People come to us and they want to learn about their building and where are the problems and where should I invest. But we also use this tool a lot for research purposes, to look at trends of different technologies. So I'm not going to go into this a lot. There's just this one slide I want to show you where these are the different categories in the survey. This is our seven point satisfaction scale from very dissatisfied to very satisfied. These bars represent the 20 to 25 to 75th percentile with the mean as the red dot. And it's ordered in terms of mean satisfaction. And what you can see here is that the lowest satisfaction in buildings is these indoor environmental quality attributes. Okay? So anything where the, the mean or uh, the median is to the left of zero means we're, we've got more than 50% of the people dissatisfied in buildings. Okay, so those of you who are familiar with ASHRAE Standard 55, what's the goal of ASHRAE Standard 55? We want to satisfy how many people? 80%. 80%. Okay, that's the aspirational goal of our building standards. Now, if you were a manufacturer and your goal was that no more than 20% of your customers were dissatisfied with your product, you'd probably be out of business. But that's basically how high we set the bar for our buildings, which is not only not very high, but we're not even meeting that. <coughs> okay, so what I want to talk about in the rest of this talk is give you examples of some of the research we do in CBE, um, organized in terms of what I'm calling paradigm shifts, new ways of thinking about the way we design and operate buildings. Okay? Now, to be honest, they're not entirely new. But if you look at the building uh, profession, they're certainly not being implemented on a widespread basis. Okay? So they're not necessarily original and innovative. Well, there's one really cool thing in there. But we just need to change getting this into practice. Why aren't we doing this? Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is shifting from the artificial active to the natural passive. But this is not just um, passive buildings. It's also hybrid buildings. And I'm going to talk about a little bit about the research that Christoph alluded to about developing uh, adaptive comfort standards for naturally ventilated buildings. So give you a whirlwind tour of this research that he alluded to, which changed the standards. So back in the mid 80s, when I was an assistant professor, oh, I just dated myself. OK, um, I was 10 years old. And <laughs> so we were funded by ASHRAE to develop laboratory grade methods that could be applied to the field to study thermal comfort in real buildings. And long story short, after doing that, ASHRAE then funded a number of organizations to use the exact same methods in different climate zones. And 10 years later, researchers from around the world were all using the methods that were first developed at Berkeley. But when they would publish, they were doing like just one study at a time, or they would use different methods of analysis. So my colleague Richard Dedier in, in uh, Sydney and I decided, what if we got the raw data from all of these people around the world using similar methods and create this meta database and then analyze it separately for air conditioned and naturally ventilated buildings using standard methods of analysis. And that's what this work was all about. So we had 160 buildings, four continents. I have to say, since this time, my colleagues at Berkeley, and this database is publicly available, my colleagues at Berkeley have been working on what we call database two, which is even significantly larger than this. So stay tuned in the next five years, even more good analysis coming out of that. So conventional standards, why are we challenging this? Conventional standards are based on laboratory studies and artificial conditions where I think this person is sleeping in the back. Um, we don't 
we don't know how much those have any uh, relationship with what's happening in real buildings. The other problem is that the standards that are based in these conditions have been universally applied where we say all buildings, all people, all cultures, all the time, all feel the same way. Well, we know that's not true. But once, until you have the data to show otherwise and a theory on which to base it, you can't make change. So adaptive comfort theory, the idea there is instead of a heat balance, a purely heat balance model, because don't get me wrong, I believe in heat balance, I believe in physics, I believe in science. Um, this is saying we're more than just passive recipients of the environment. We interact with our buildings. We adapt to our buildings. And we adapt in a variety of ways. Physiological adaptation is when the physiological set points in our body actually change, acclimatization, where we might, our, our sweat glands, when vasoconstriction dilation occur, actually change as we've been living and working in more extreme environments. Behavioral adaptation, I reach out, I turn on a fan, open a window, I change my clothing, I change my activity. All of those are called behavioral adaptations, which actually physically change the heat balance between myself and the environment. And the last one is psychological adaptation. And the idea there is that my satisfaction is going to be influenced by context. Do, is there a match between what I expected to happen and what I actually got? D is my interaction with the building having an effect on that psychological expectation? So I'm just going to show you these two graphs from the study. So um, the x-axis here is an outdoor temperature index called effective temperature. You're all familiar with wind chill. Just think of this as wind chill on steroids. So it also you know, takes into account humidity, for example. So it's a way of taking a lot of climate variables and having a combined um, equivalent temperature. The y-axis is an indoor comfort temperature. Think of it as your preferred temperature. So there's two different um, ways we looked at this data. And the data points themselves have been removed just to simplify the graphs. All you're seeing here is regressions through the data. So for those of you in the building technology area, you're probably familiar with Fenger's predicted mean vote, the PMV, which is the laboratory-based empirical model that says, given all of these measured conditions, how am I going to predict what the average thermal sensation of a group of people would be? Okay. So that's what this dark line is, the predicted, um, the predicted comfort temperature based on this laboratory model. The dotted red line is based on a regression through our field studies. We asked people, well, how do you feel right now? And we measured their temperature and humidity and air movement and radiant temperature. And then we looked at those regressions separately for the centrally controlled uh, mechanical systems and naturally ventilated buildings. So let's look here. The first trend you see are the lines are really close. And I was a bit of a research rebel. I guess I still am a little bit when I first did this. And I wanted to prove the laboratory methods wrong. Well, I had to eat my words there, didn't I? Because they were pretty close. So what that's saying to me is that when you have a building where you have no control in the environment, and the building is maybe not that much different than the laboratory conditions in which that model was developed, on average, when you look at large quantities of data, on average, people respond based on the pure heat balance model. The other thing you notice is that there is a slight slope as outdoor temperature changes. It's very slight. Outdoor temperature changed over 40 degrees C, and our indoor comfort temperature changed less than 2 degrees C. What that's saying is that I adapt a little bit. I change my clothing a little bit. But I'm basically getting addicted to this narrow range of indoor temperatures that I've been experiencing, and I dress for the indoors. And if I get uncomfortable, I scream loudly and the conditions snap back to that. So there's not a lot of adaptation, and all of it can be explained by these empirical models. Contrast that with a, a picture on the right. There's two things you see. One, the slope of both lines is much steeper, which means even this solid line where you're able to predict the effects of clothing. People in these buildings were dressing more for the outdoor. They had wider variety of dress over the course of the year. So even what was predicted covered a wider range. 
But there is a complete mismatch between the observed and the predicted, which means there's a lot of things that are not in that heat balance model that are affecting people's comfort. And that's the psychological adaptation. That's the expectation. When I can reach out and open a window and change my environment, when I have some kind of control over my environment, or when I have a thermal history that's more variable, I come to get used to a more variable environment. And I not only tolerate, this is actually preferred temperature. I actually prefer conditions that more closely reflect the natural swings of the outdoor environment. OK, so to go from there to the ASHRAE standard, I'm not going to tell the long story of that. In short, that their standards are really a combination of um, good peer-reviewed research, filling in the gaps with professional judgment, and a whole lot of compromise and negotiation. So there's some things that had to change. They wanted to dumb it down a bit. They replaced ET star with outdoor temperature. But a lot of people are going back to the original research and the equations that account for humidity. They took that um, ideal line, which is the center, and they created an 80 and 90% comfort zone. Okay. But there's not that many buildings that can really be operated purely on natural ventilation. So the real movement now is what's called mixed mode buildings. This is where you're combining natural ventilation with some form of hopefully efficient mechanical cooling. Okay. And there's different ways to configure that. Don't need to get into the details other than to say most people just think, oh my god, how can I open the windows and let all that mechanical um, cooling go out the window? It's wasteful. But a lot of mixed mode buildings are not operated that way. Yes, they have operable windows and mechanical cooling, but they don't necessarily operate in the same space or at the same time. And mixed mode refers to that whole continuum. So there's been a lot of mixed mode research done at UC Berkeley. I'm just going to show you one example. Um, in addition to the adaptive comfort, um, we do a lot of the surveys. We've been looking at these signaling systems. I'm going to show you uh, this one right here, which is where we use simulation to look at the feasibility of mixed mode buildings in California. And the reason we focused on California is that the project was funded by the California Energy Commission. But I think the methods we developed can then easily be applied to uh, other locations. The basic idea here is that we took a base building and we wanted to take a building that was working well and we were going to put it in these different climate zones. And for those of you not familiar with California, our entire state is divided into 16 climate zones. We have very diverse climates. In general, the lower the number, the cooler the climate, the higher the number, the warmer the climate. So it starts on the coast, and then the numbers get bigger as you go inland. And we took this a basic building that we knew to be operating well in a California climate, and we simulated that building by making these changes, by looking at a conventional VAV system, a natural ventilation only with night flush, and then a mixed mode system where we chose to use radiant cooling. And we put that in different climates. And the, this is just the legend for the graph I'm about to show you. What we're going to do in this graph is we're going we're to look at what the discomfort predictions were. And we're also going to look at what the energy performance was. And this legend should just make intuitive sense. right? If you're using natural ventilation only, the blue, you're not using any energy. But you might have more discomfort. And if you're using a sealed building, you're, you, if you throw enough energy at it, you can, in theory, through simulation, um, reduce all of your discomfort. And then the mixed mode is going to be somewhere in the middle. So we did that for all of the 16 climate zones. And as we expected, as you get hotter, the natural ventilation only is going to have more and more discomforts, which started to suggest, well, natural ventilation by itself in the commercial building that we simulated, no surprise. When it gets really hot, you can't get away with just natural ventilation. Um, energy increased as well. And then we used uh, some mapping tools to look at what regions of California was, nat was, was operable windows, natural ventilation, feasible by itself, 
you could see it's really only along the coast where you could get away with using natural ventilation only. But as soon as you do mixed mode buildings, pretty much throughout the whole state, there was an ability to have a building that could be energy efficient and also improve comfort by carefully balancing using air conditioning when and where you need it, but just not all the time. And that's the direction we need to go. We need to think more holistically about an integration of systems rather than just throwing one solution at the problem. <laughs> Okay, the next strategy or paradigm shift I want to talk about is moving away from conditioning space to thinking about conditioning people, right? We don't really care what the temperature is at the ceiling, right? We're trying to make people comfortable. And from, from the uh, Dilbert cartoon, you could see that with centralized control, it's very difficult to satisfy all of the people all of the time. So a lot of the research we're doing at Berkeley is looking at what we call PCS, or personalized comfort systems. And this is analogous to the idea of task ambient lighting, which we're all very familiar with. Right? You take the ambient lighting and you ratchet it down because you don't need really high light levels in the corridors and the circulation spaces. And then you give task lighting on the desk so that you can have the higher levels when and where you need it and under the control of the people makes complete common sense. What we're trying to do now is push that same paradigm into the idea of thermal conditioning. So we've been doing a lot of research on this for years. We use simulation laboratory and field studies. We've done a lot of testing of really looking at the physiology of the body and what's most effective for keeping people comfortable so we can develop devices that are going to be um, most effective for keeping us comfortable, give people control, save energy, but also make it um, adaptable and adop adoptable <coughs> to buildings. So our first generation, um, we focused on a uh, fan and a foot warmer. All of these devices, because we've developed them for research purposes, these devices are all able to um, have sensors built in so that we can measure the usability and measure the, the uh, temperature and local conditions. They also all have occupancy sensors of some sort built in. So here there's an occupancy sensor in the, in the center of the fan. The foot warmer actually has a pressure plate. Right? So when you walk away, it's not heating or cooling a void of space. We're focusing on the body. Now, when you go down to your local hardware store and you buy one of those floor heaters that you see lots of people bringing in to the office, anybody know what those are rated at? About 1,000 to 1,500 watts, to put this into perspective. Okay? So people are cold in the office. They're all bringing in these little heaters they bought you know, at Target, putting them under their desk, running it at 1,000 watts, and walking away, and it stays on. These average of 30 watts. So what we're really excited about is our second generation, which is the heated and cooled chair. How many people have heated chairs in their car? Really, really nice. There's got to be more hands. Okay. So this is the idea of taking an office chair, and it's about heating and cooling the body rather than space. It uses incredibly low levels of energy, on average 14 watts for heating, 3.5 watts for cooling. It's a rechargeable battery, so you don't have to have it tethered. You can use it maybe up to a week you know, or less, depending on um, how much you're using it. It's uh, got, we're, we've been developing some new control strategies. I want to do a shout out to Mallory, who I can't see because of the light. But one of our former students now here um, working for Arup, who worked on some of the early research, we've now built 50 of these in our lab and sent it out to lots of different buildings where we've been field testing them. We're able to um, also do intervention studies in these buildings where we're able to change the set points you know, and play around and then see how people are using them. So we're looking at behavior and also what their comfort levels are. So, Comfort, this is phenomenal. Over a 20 degree Fahrenheit range, we've been able of ambient temperature, we've been able to get more than 90% of the people satisfied 
while saving up to 60% of the energy. So the potential for this is phenomenal. Um, we've also, some of the um, behavior patterns we've been seeing, it's interesting. We're seeing that even when people are feeling slightly warm, they still have the, the heaters on because I think they just feel good or if you're having back pain. So it's just interesting to learn about that. And there's incredible variety in how people are using these as well, which is an indication that people like different things. Right? So we're also um, collaborating with a company called Comfy, which was actually founded by UC Berkeley students. This is a tool that also allows people to have some personal control. So it's set up if you have a standard VAV system in your office that you're able to use either a phone app or your computer to say, I'm cold or I'm warm, and get an immediate blast of more warm or cold air to satisfy your immediate comfort needs. And then it kind of ramps back down to a normal setting. And there's ways to use um, different settings for shared environments. So we're taking our. Um, we're taking our chair, we're taking Comfy, we're using SMAP, which is a software also developed by UC Berkeley in the EECS department, which, um, and using all of that to allow rapid access and visualization of data from all of these different places so that you can control the system, you can collect data from the, um, from the chair, you can use the Comfy app, you can collect survey data. So it's a really nice system for trying to get that all into one place. Okay, so the next um, shift I want to talk about, which is not new, but it's not being used in buildings as rapidly in this country as I think it needs to be. We're seeing a lot more of it in Europe, and that's this idea of moving from air systems to radiant systems. Okay? So one reason for doing that is simply because of the heat capacity of air versus water. So if you use water, which on a volumetric heat capacity is three times higher than air, the, the, the size of the pipes that has to run through your building to carry that amount of heating and cooling through the space is so much smaller than the ductwork. So architects really like that because they don't have to give up as much space, right? You also have much, much less pumping energy needed compared to the fans to move all that air. So one of the ways that we're trying to move forward in high performance buildings is to, to you know, avoid the one trick pony that I mentioned. Decouple your ventilation needs and your thermal needs. And so you're not making the air system do all the work. You actually, if you have a radiant system and you still need some air for ventilation, you need a very small amount of air that can be tempered before it's introduced into the space compared to how much air you need if the air is doing all of the work for cooling. And we're often overcooling spaces as a result. So air and radiant systems operate fundamentally differently in terms of the, the way they extract heat from the buildings. Their total cooling rates, their rate of, of, of cooling rates, um, the temperatures that they're maintaining. Uh, these are controlled mainly from air temperature. Radiant systems are controlled more from operative temperature. So a couple other examples of how they're different. The air systems are generally operating, uh, uh, thinking about what your immediate need is. Right? So you have heat gain, the system turns on. When you have radiant systems, and especially radiant systems with thermal mass, you can spread that conditioning out over time, which has an impact on cost rather than having all of your load at the peak part of the day when utility rates are generally higher. Right? So you can pre-cool some of the mass. You generally have a little bit more floating. You have a little bit less control of the temperature, so it might float over a wider range. One of the challenges, though, we found is that um, traditional methods, recommended methods for calculating cooling loads in buildings were not taking into account some of the unique characteristics of radiant systems where they were actually taking energy out of the building, not just from the air, making the air do all the work, but taking a radiant component as well. So we've been doing a lot of work on radiant systems. I'm just showing you one example here where we were looking at um, trying to test some of these traditional methods of calculating cooling loads. 
We did it in a lab where we could have either radiant cooling panels on the ceiling or diffusers. The floor, we had non-active mass by putting concrete pavers, and we simulated heat gain with um, a mesh, um, a, a mesh of a heating mat, and it was meshed so that the radiant ceiling could then interact with those concrete blocks. And this is just an example of some of the results that came out of this. And what we found is that the radiant system was able to remove a much higher rate of energy or a higher cooling rate than the air system, up to 18% higher during peak conditions. And that was indicated both by looking at the calculations of the cooling rates, by looking at the um, delta T of the air or the water and the flow rates, and also measuring the temperature of the slab. Right? So the lower temperatures of that floor slab in the radiant systems was indicating that more heat was being removed by the radiant ceiling. And the other thing that we were able to do with this is develop new methods for calculating the cooling um, removal rates to account for this radiant component. And then just a hint here at some other work that we've just started doing that um, is in progress of being published. Some of you might be familiar with FlexLab, which is a very uh, sophisticated laboratory facility at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. We've been doing side-by-side -side experiments of radiant and forced air systems. I'm not going to show you the data right now, but just to show you this infrared image, because I think it's really powerful at showing how these systems can perform. So if this is a radiant cooled system. This is an air system. This is the ceiling panel that's being actively cooled. That's why it's so blue. But if you look at the other surfaces, you can see that the floor here is having a significant connection to the ceiling, which means any mass in that floor, just like the laboratory experiment I just showed you, that's absorbing some of that heat, is being cooled not just to the air, which is all our air system would do, but is being cooled by this radiant connection to the ceiling. OK, and my last um, paradigm shift, if you will, will um, I am from California. So I'm going to get a little touchy-feely granola with you right now. And uh, so since I started off talking about energy, I'm going to end up talking about comfort. And I think that we need to think about well-being, how we experience the different qualities of the environment. And if you can imagine for a moment a life where you eat the same foods every day. Right? There's no change of weather or light levels. We listen to monotone sounds. We have no music in our life, no sounds of birds. It would be awful. But that's what we're doing in most of our buildings. When, when we strive for avoiding complaints, that's, that's how aspirational our standards are. If nobody notices, if nobody calls up the facility manager and complains, we must be doing OK. But I would argue that we need to design for qualities of the environment that enrich our senses and then enhance our well-being. And if you think of spaces that just feel wonderful, a lot of times those spaces are going to have some connection to variability. They're not going to be monotone. Some connections that are connected to nature. So this idea of our affinity for nature is called biophilic design. I'm not going to elaborate on that, but I wanted to give you those, these resources. So if any among you are interested in this, there's an organization called Terrapin Bright Green that's put out these free reports on the web that are very comprehensive. They have been looking for the scientific basis for how these different patterns of biophilic design actually have a physiological effect on our stress levels, our levels of cortisol, and all of these different um, cognitive measures. And they've actually done a pretty phenomenal job of trying to look at where the scientific evidence is for those connections. And I think, in summary, I want to say that I think we need to do more to reward the buildings that are doing well in terms of the people, in terms of occupant well-being, in terms of health. 
And one of the things we've done at CBE um, for many years is we've created something called the Livable Buildings Award. It's kind of like the People's Choice Award. So what we do every year is we look at the buildings that have taken our survey. And you have to be, um, we have some qualifying criteria. So you have to be a good performer from the people point of view in terms of the quality of the indoor environment. And then you become eligible. And once we have the group of eligible buildings, it is a jury competition. And those people then look for other elements of good design and good energy performance. But we start with buildings that are working well from the people's point of view. And I think that's the starting point that we have to um, take on. Thank you. And I think we have time for questions. Very, very enjoyable talk. Thank you, Leon. And, and certainly, I'm a great proponent of natural ventilation. But one of the questions I had is, is in some of the early work, it, uh, to use the adaptive comfort standard, it had to be a building that had no means of air conditioning, that it had to be purely uh, naturally ventilated building. Now, have you relaxed those requirements? Um, that's a really good question. So right now, standard 55 says that the adaptive comfort standard can only be applied to buildings without any mechanical cooling at all. In other words, they don't apply to mixed mode. In practice, many of the engineers I'm talking to are actually doing it anyway. Um, the argument in the committee was that, well, most of the database was only naturally ventilated buildings. It wasn't mixed mode, so we can't apply it. And then other people would argue, well, the entire standard is based on laboratory experiments and no buildings at all. So you're almost you know, applying a higher criteria. But the short answer is no, it hasn't been expanded yet in the, in the standard. I think it's being expanded in practice. And I think that's a really important next step for research. Have you done any surveys, in, very many surveys in mixed mode buildings? We've done a lot more surveys in mixed mode buildings because it's much less expensive to do that. But the kind of field studies you have to do to have the kind of data that, that we generated the adaptive comfort standard for is much more expensive. And that has not been done as extensively. Now, that said, that's database two that we are growing. There is probably mixed mode buildings in there. So the next step is to mine the data we've collected from around the world, which we've really just finished the collection part of it rather than having to start from scratch. And I think that may have some potential if we've got some good mixed mode buildings in there. So for now, we can cheat with honor. Yeah, cheat with honor. I think there's one in the middle there. <laughs> yeah, uh, very, very, very informative talk. Uh, I have a comment more than uh, a question uh, to see if you could add to it. Uh, I'm an architect, and my frustration a lot of times revolves around the fact that many of these projects, when they go into design or construction, start off with a separate bucket, which is the construction budget. And those construction budgets are based on preconceived ideas of historic costs and so forth. And they don't allow for a lot of the innovative things that I saw in your talk, which are, which are you know, probably more upfront costs with technologies to help with lower operating costs. And it's just a shift that we still kind of look at things in buckets. Uh, what are you finding in terms of when you talk to users in how they should plan for these facilities to take life cycle costs and so forth. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a great question. I think when you do have just singular buckets and one item at a time, then during the value engineering process, which has nothing to do with adding value, nor is it about engineering, so I think it's really misnamed there, we'll, we'll, we'll take out one line item at a time. So a couple of things. One, the more this, those systems and strategies are integrated, the harder it is to just cross it out. And secondly, I am seeing an increasing number of case studies where there are z &E buildings that are coming in at or below the um, conventional cost of buildings. And the way they do that is take a more, get, get rid of the buckets and take a more integrated look so that if you can figure out how to reduce the, the cooling needs and particularly the peak loads in your building, save substantially on the um, cost of the mechanical system, 
then the upfront money you're saving on a smaller or different kind of mechanical system can go into the extra cost of envelope improvements. And if you think about it on a more holistic way like that, then it does not necessarily have to be a higher cost. So you just have to get away from the one line at a time. There was a question right here. I am Salman Craig from the GSD. We met um, while I was at Foster and Partners. We invited you over to talk about the Apple campus. Right. Big fan of your work. Thank um, you. Uh, use it a lot. I tell my students that as well. And uh, especially in line of explaining to them that um, uh, the comfort standards lag behind our understanding of the physiology, of, uh, physiology psychology, and behavioral aspects of, of comfort, right? And, and they too evolve. And designers sort of have a responsibility to think about that too, about their set points and what that means, right? Um, I have a question about the, the database 2.0, which I'm very yes. excited to hear that's <laughs> happening. Um, it's simultaneously a methodological question, but also hopefully opening up um, a little discussion about um, some of the nuances that we might have um, to uh, explore with design uh, at the architectural level uh, in orchestrating patterns of working and living, because that's sort of what we talk about really, right? Um, when you're doing the surveys, are they, is it, are you taking the data while people are experiencing thermal sensations or after? And the reason why I ask is because I've been reading up on uh, um, quite a bit about this at the moment. Um, we might expect some very interesting differences. Uh, I don't know if you know uh, da Daniel Kahneman, the uh, Nobel um, Prize winning economist. Um, he wrote Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. He, he found uh, a difference between the way we um, experience thermal sensations and the way we remember them, right? Uh, and if we've, he, he showed this generally for, for many things, um, but he actually started his experiments with thermal sensation. Yeah. They were the simplest so things there, to do. There's, um, there's two different kinds of surveys that we do. And I've shown both, but I, I wasn't really clear on the differences. The, um, the database I, sh I talked about where we have over 1,000 buildings and over 100,000 people, that's what we call a general satisfaction survey. And those are general impressions. It's not thermal sensation. And then we have a short survey that we call a right now survey. How do you feel right now? And those are the ones that were used as the basis for the thermal comfort field studies that were part of the adaptive comfort standard that are part of database two. And that's where you, you measure people's conditions right at their desk and you say, how are you feeling right now? And then you can map, because of the time stamps of the continuous measurements, what they were feeling and how they felt at the moment. So first, you asked about what kind of service. Those are two entirely different kinds. There's probably still, um, it, even when we ask, how do you feel right now, there's no guarantee that they're saying, well, well, wait a minute. I was really cold 15 minutes ago, but now, but now I'm comfortable, and I want you to know what happened 15 minutes ago. That might be happening, and we don't really know the answer to that. I think part of it, you just try to ask a whole lot of people so you have a very large sample size. So I guess I'd, um, to dominate, just to um, ask it this way then, um, what might be your uh, speculations or intuitions about wh those gray areas uh, where we might sort of start to see some opportunities to yeah. start playing? So I think thermal memory actually probably plays a really big role. Um, and I, I'm not sure if this answers your question, but I would say if we're going to start playing around with that, let's think about using it in a positive way. And there's a concept called allesthesia. Has anybody heard this word? OK, so allesthesia is basically the physiological basis for thermal pleasure. And it says that unless we have some kind of contrast or variability, the way our, th our thermal receptors and our skin work, you can't feel anything better than neutral or comfortable unless you actually went from feeling slightly cool or slightly warm to getting some relief. That's the ah feeling. Right? And so I think maybe thermal memory and concepts of allesthesia could work together to really try to be very intentional in creating delightful thermal experiences rather than just neutral ones. Yes. Hi, uh, Matt from Ember Labs. Um, you mentioned both the theme of like lab versus in the fields, 
and the theme of people cost two orders of magnitude more than energy. So, what? How? How is it going? Trying to show all these, all this money, sort of, you know, being materialized from improved productivity. Is there yeah. like? Not going well. It's a. <laughs> The, the idea of measuring productivity is really, really hard. First of all, you can't measure what you can't define, and that's the essence of the problem. I think most of the studies that have been done are like, OK, well, how, how many you know, call centers or processing widgets or really mechanical kind of ob, uh, task ob objectives, but anything involving the knowledge worker and creative work, it's really, really difficult. Um, so there are people out there, we need more psychologists in this field, and there's an increasing number, but not fast enough, who understand how to actually develop cognitive measures that measure things that are related to the knowledge worker and creativity, and it's tremendously difficult. But I'm starting to see some change, so stay tuned in a couple of years, maybe we'll be able to learn more, but it's very difficult. There's one way in the back. Um, thank you so much for your talk. You're welcome, Holly. Um, you're talking about uh, mixed mode in shared commercial spaces. And I'm wondering if you have studied very much um, how much do we have to design for just the use of those spaces versus the abuse? So there's different levels of controls. Like you showed the one where it's red light, green light. You can right. open your window, which is a pretty low cost solution. And then other buildings are going so far as to say, let's put sensors in. And so the systems can't be working simultaneously. So. Do you have some sense of, of where we should be? I mean, how wow. much do we need to worry about? Where that sweet spot is. You know what? I, I'm a fan of keeping it simpler. And I collaborate with engineers who are on that end of the spectrum. And I collaborate with engineers who are like, no, we need to automate everything because we cannot trust those pesky people. And the, the red-green lights, which I call informational controls, uh, we had somebody do a really nice master's thesis on that. And it's the first and only time I've seen them studied systematically. And basically, people disobey. They are pesky people. But it turned out it didn't really matter. And when you talk to the um, designers to say, well, what was your objective? Why did you put those in? Nobody actually expected people to operate as if they were the, the actuators. And it was more about an informational control and maybe to move from the direction of completely chaotic, do whatever you want, in the direction of do what's sensible, but nobody ever expected it to be a replacement. I think it's context matters. Um, I, I think that when you have um, a smaller building, a work culture with environmental values, where there's good communication, there's a saying that, that passive buildings require active occupants. And I would t add to that that it needs active and educated occupants. So if you're in an environment where you've got good communication, you can educate the, the workers, they're sort of all on board, they're value driven, you're likely to be able to have a building that's entirely in the hands of the occupants and do just fine. I worry if you move too far into the automated, you lose the adaptive effects. If you have operable windows but you can't reach out and open them, then the building's not going to be operating like, um, like these adaptive standards predict they will. I'm equally really excited about the new database 2.0, and I wonder about cultural differences between by country or maybe by workforce. Now that you have a bigger database, are you able to tweak out these differences? There's anecdotal evidence uh, in Pakistan and India has been some work right, that there are the accepted temperature range is a lot higher. Right. Well, that's exactly the intention. Um, I'm actually finishing up a five-year project in India, and we're trying to look at the database now with um, India versus US, just taking a slice of it. We're literally just coming to the end of the phase of collecting all of this data and getting the permissions from all of the um, authors who contributed it but said, don't make it public yet, because some of them were trying to publish it on their own first, and we wanted to give them time. So we're literally just in the phase of finalizing this and getting permission from the authors. But the intention is to make it public. And then we'll be doing our own analysis, but we're not planning on being very protective. We're, we're very into sharing. <laughs> Another okay. question that was a uh, work really not from you, but from Stefano Scavion that looked at this new data set, this large data set you had. 
and uh, the difference between lead rated building and non lead rated building, oh, and I, that the occupant satisfaction was not so good. You know, there's a reason I didn't include that, Christoph, yeah. but go ahead. <laughs> so I think that's a very interesting point because it speaks to our whole field that just to give everybody a sense that the lead rated buildings were not so much better. How do you feel about that? Is that a, a collective failure? How do I us? feel about it or how do I think about it? What do you really want to know? Because, okay. <laughs> All right, so, okay, so, so the work he's referring to, we took this large database and divided it into buildings that were um, lead rated and buildings that were not. And the hypothesis was that lead buildings are supposed to have better IEQ and therefore better IEQ satisfaction. And it really didn't come out that way. So then we recently been diving deeper into the why because the first papers that came out just showed not working, but didn't really talk about why. So we're literally weeks away from submitting a publication about the why, which um, the, the gist of it is, I think some of the arguments I can make is one, was it even supposed to? Lead is, design, is, is based on design intention. And between the time you have design intention and then you build the building and you operate the building, um, there, there's so much that can happen in between that obviously has. So it should, but they're really, I think the lead measures are really not particularly oriented towards what's going to actually happen at the end there. Um, there could also be a problem with what we were comparing it to. I think the bars being raised in terms of building stock in general. So when I'm saying there wasn't a big difference, in the buildings we were looking at, IEQ was still pretty good. So we're not saying that they were all bad. We were kind of saying they were all good and maybe a little bit better, but not greater. So it may be that there wasn't a big difference because we were doing better in the other building stock as well. And then there is a whole lot of issues about just problems with um, building operation. There are other things that I think people can't perceive. So indoor air quality is a great example where there's a lot of aspects of indoor air quality that a satisfaction scale is not going to capture. Right, that um, we, we just can't sense things. And then there's a lot of problems with acoustics. And guess what? Lee didn't even have any points with acoustics. So I, I don't know if that answered your <laughs> question. That was more about what I think, what I feel about it. Am I happy about it? No. I, I want to make better buildings. And I'm hoping that the rating systems, whether it be LEED or Living Building Challenge or the new well building standard, the intention is to use these to make better buildings. And if they do or don't, it's not about point chasing. We need to better understand the why. And I don't think we spent enough time on that. In the back. You. Hi, thank you for your talk. I'm interested in um, large multifamily buildings. Um, so I was wondering if you, if your team has done um, field studies um, in them, or if there's there are any particular outcomes yeah. you'd like to share. So not yet, but we've just started a project. Our work has primarily been commercial, and within the commercial, primarily but not exclusively offices. And we've just started a three-year project looking at um, multifamily housing, particularly in the um, affordable housing sector where we're looking at smart fans combined with learning thermostats and trying this idea of air movement and trying to use the benefits of expanded air movement to minimize air conditioning costs. And we're doing both lab studies and field studies. But we're just at the beginning of a three-year project. It is funded by the California Energy Commission, so it is just about California buildings. But hopefully, the broader lessons learned can um, maybe be applied to other environments as well. So stay tuned. Thank you. So just to say, I was just told we, this has to be the last question, just because I guess we have to leave this building. I think there's a reception afterwards, or we are outside. Yes, I'm a freshman, and um, anyone can go down and talk to Professor Baker. OK. Just have to wrap it up. As long as you call me Gail. But thank you. Um, I think, was there a, a, you're right in the light, so I can't even oh, yeah. see. OK. Can you? Okay. 
Hi, um, I'm Alan from Cool Composites. Um, we're putting PCMs into other uh, building materials um, so that architects and contractors don't sort of have to deal with them. Um, you mentioned thermal mass a little bit, um, but I was wondering whether you've done any other work um, looking into thermal mass. Um, you mentioned integration into radiant um, cooling systems, yeah. but other systems as well. Um, the work we've been doing on thermal mass is it's pretty much limited to the radiant systems. I've been looking at it in my work in India, but in, um, but less applicable, I think, in some of the buildings in the U.S., but in terms of the more uh, commercial building models that we see in the U.S., we've just been looking at it with regard to the radiant systems of the, the thermally activated slabs and also some radiant systems that are just the lightweight panels. We have not been looking at phase change materials, but I think that has great promise in our industry, and maybe one day we'll start looking at that too. Okay, so I think you wrapped it up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.